It's the end of 5th edition, and it is the end, and an uncertain gaming hobby is now looking out and wondering what's next. We haven't received new 1D&D playtests except for the OGL rewrites, and folks have sort of forgotten it existed. The OGL nonsense, speaking of which, is mostly wrapped up, with beholders apparently entering the creative commons. That's interesting, I guess. And we're left with a large swath of the hobby suddenly, finally receptive to the idea of playing a different game. While folks decide on their new game of choice, I want to look back on the edition that's taken the better part of a decade of our lives, and I want to set the record straight. The pros, the cons, the disappointments. What was this game we're all gonna abandon? And why are we abandoning it? Howdy folks, Gelatinous Rube here. Welcome to our 5th edition retrospective. I wanted to start this series off with a monster. They're what makes the game, the challenges we face. In 5th edition, those challenges are monsters. We're talking about the Jabberwocky today because I wanted a monster that really encapsulated 5e's approach to monsters. That drove home just how committed and creative the designers of the world's greatest role-playing game really are. It's pretty bad. The Jabberwocky is a lizard with a spell effect pasted onto it. It doesn't deviate from the core non-design of dragons as big bags of hit points, and it wastes a ton of text on unimportant features or quirks that won't come up in the game, don't have anything to do with the mechanics, and certainly have no business being in its stat block to begin with. It doesn't evoke myth or wonder or fantasy. It doesn't evoke its source material by any stretch of the imagination. Here, take a listen. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the moam wraths outgrave. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jump jump bird, and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the man's own foe he sought, so rested he by the tum-tum tree, and stood a while in thought. And, as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tolgy wood, and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through, the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O frabjous day, Kalu Kalei. He chortled in his joy. Twas brillig, and the slithy toes, Did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borogoves, And the moam wraths out grave. Now, I've certainly mispronounced at least a few of those, But I don't really care, it was a nonsense poem. Let's talk about the stat block. Now, the Jabberwocky doesn't look all that different from a Monster Manual's dragon on first glance. It has three legendary actions, a tail swipe, a rend attack, which might represent its claws bite or both, and a wingbeat attack. It has three legendary resistances, allowing it to shrug off the effects of failing a saving throw against whatever might cause it or force it to make a saving throw to begin with. Regeneration just allows it to regain 10 hit points at the start of each round, unless it takes slashing damage, just regular slashing damage. How are you going to have this thing fight a party that does not have slashing damage? What are the odds your party is not going to be able to use slashing damage against this thing? The Jabberwocky's combat features include a line attack, functionally indistinguishable from a dragon's breath weapon, but he can blind the Jabberwocky to keep it from doing this, requiring a recharge. It can also produce the effects of the Confusion spell once before it has to roll a 6 on a recharge going forward. This is a mythical creature from Lewis Carroll. It appears in the Chronicles of Amber that inspired D&D to begin with. Why is it just a high armor class lizard with a breath weapon and 4th level spells stapled onto it? Now the Jabberwocky shows up in Wild Beyond the Witchlight, a module pitched as showing off 5e's non-combat virtues. Whether it succeeds on that front is 
not a debate or point I'm willing to fight over in this video at the very least. What I will demand is that a module focus on the wild, the weird, the fairies, the tales of European and American mythologies and their realm does something a little more interesting than make the Jabberwock a house pet. Come on y'all, you really couldn't think outside the box on this one, could you? At the very least, some cool environmental effects or impacts on enchantments or curses or any of the plot where you find it, the Jabberwocky is supposed to be in some kind of time-halted mansion. Why not put a bunch of magical enchantments and traps the Jabberwocky can work around? Maybe the Jabberwocky gets to bypass a lot of enchantments or magical protections as part of its stat block. Why am I the one asking these questions instead of the designers? Now, a lot of my ire comes from the fact that dragons in 5th edition suck. Everyone knows they suck, and it's not just because monsters in general suck. Dragons specifically have a wider library of video games, myths, cultural traditions, books, movies, and existing media from other role-playing games, probably more so than any other mythical creature in existence. There is absolutely no comparison to any other monster type, historical or original, in the wealth any game master or game designer may take advantage of. You have to be so bad at your job to make dragons boring, but this is 5th edition and we've no shortage of designers bad at their jobs. Dragons in 5th edition have the same loadout of perception checks, tail attacks, and wing beat attacks as legendary actions. They have breath weapons with recharge, which they'll probably just use once per combat. These breath weapons don't do anything interesting, by the way, just a lot of damage and an area of effect. They have a claw attack and a bite attack, which deals some damage and nothing else. They can frighten you, and if you save against being frightened, you can't be frightened again for 24 hours by which point the dragon will probably be dead. Most dragons can claw twice and bite once in a round. Sometimes, sometimes, dragon lairs have a cool few abilities, like uh, making clouds of obscure and dust, or shifting pools of acid. But if you all just want to drop a dragon into an overland encounter, or plot them in a dungeon, the boring is hell. There's no excuse for this. Seven years into release. Come on, folks. Listen, folks, I'm not in charge of redesigning all of 5th edition. That's for the good folks at Paizo to handle. I spent too many years doing it as is. Once Chill Miss Valley and the spell redesigns are finished, I see no reason to continue, but I just can't criticize without doing better in one fashion or another. What I will provide you is a glimpse of how better systems, perhaps a post 5e -E or different core system, would have handled these issues. Here's a fun little experiment. Zine Quest is on a Kickstarter, and I have yet to participate in a single one. I'm fixing that at the end of this week, launching Seven Willows at the end of this week. It's an exploration-focused scene about a warden, or ranger, or druid if y'all prefer, taking up management of several magical forests upon their master's death. So how would the Jabberwock show up here? Well, first of all, any creature that shows up in its territory is going to suffer from the stalked condition. Stalked allows you to replace one of your travel rolls with a kind of saving throw made against the creature responsible. Something always goes wrong while you're exploring, something always gets in your way. A lot of conditions in Seven Willows just lets you know what that thing is ahead of time. Additionally, the target takes an extra hour to travel and an extra hour to sleep. Beady eyes in the dark lay heavy upon the mind. A nuisance, but it pays to be wary. Claws weigh even heavier upon the throat. Combat is a process of making up up to seven contested checks to determine the outcome. You gain a bonus for each roll you commit to in advance, can expend resources in place of rolls like ammunition and spells, and determine the result once all checks are revealed. Some of these checks are an act of defense, warding yourself against, say, monsters which toy with your mind. Monsters flee, pay, bleed, lead you to neat locales or their lairs, or make themselves available for training. The Jabberwocky doesn't like to get killed, it prefers to confuse anything it can't make an easy meal out of before fleeing and changing its lair. 
Alfred does get beaten in combat, but still manages to confuse your character. It will turn itself into a companion you protect until the Jabberwocky feels safe attacking you again. Until then, y'all get to ride it, and it helps you in combat. If this kind of gameplay sounds interesting to you, and I already know that it does, click on the Google form below and we'll send you an email when the Kickstarter goes live. Alright now, enough with the plug, how about some other games? Here's a blast from the past, how about Advanced Dungeons & Dragons? We'll say the Jabberwocky has about, oh, I don't know, 82 hit points. Ivories deal damage equal to its current hit points, following from the typical rule, a dragon's breath weapon will deal damage equal to its current hit points, nasty critters. I give the Jabberwock a, pff, a free grapple or unarmed attack whenever its claws strike a creature. The unarmed tables in 1st edition may look weird and complex, and they are, but they provide a fantastic alternative combat system. You'll be hearing about them very soon. The keys to just, or the key to using these properly is to just roll your percentile first and worry about the effects of height, weight, armor, etc. later. To get the Jabberwock's weight, we're just going to multiply its hit points by 50, say it's around 12 feet tall for the purposes of unarmed tables, and we'll give it an additional bonus of plus 10 to all rolls on unarmed tables. That's pummel, overbear, and grappling attacks. Creatures who were affected by the Jabberwock's uh, confusion, because we'll retain its ability to do that, will automatically fail all contested unarmed rolls versus the Jabberwock, and the spells, we'll say that spells targets have to be determined randomly by those affected. And, finally, affected creatures will only subdue the dragon, not kill it. Y'all may not know this, but dragons can be bought and sold in first edition. Finally, we'll say that the Jabberwock may set for charge using what else but the jaws that bite for its damage. Setting for charge, by the way, is where you take something like a, a you take a polearm, something like a spear, and prepare yourself for an enemy to charge at you. If you all succeed on the attack, you all deal double damage with the weapon. Now how about a Pathfinder 2nd Edition? Let's just completely switch game types here. What if the Let's say our Pathfinder 2e Jabberwock is able to grapple or decrement weapon durability on a crit. Dragons in 2nd edition get a lot of special bonuses on critical hits, and critical hits are much easier to get in 2nd edition. You just have to roll 10 above your target number. But what if the Jabberwock spawns in minions or manifests other manifestations of its chaos, like special living spells or weird environmental effects? Dragons in Pathfinder 2nd Edition often have the ability to recharge their breath weapons on a crit. We could make the dragon automatically crit against confused creatures. Wait a second. Wait, wait, wait just a damn minute. It, it turns out that Pathfinder 2nd Edition already has a Jabberwocky, and y'all can look at it for free. It's on Archives of Nethys. Uh, point of order, it looks like 2nd Edition's Jabberwock focus most of the cooler traits of the beast on their physical attributes, their physical attacks. Pretty damned interesting, if you ask me, and there's a bunch of neat variants, like a two-headed Jabberwock. Nothing comforts me more than knowing that there are other proficient and, dare I say, professional designers out there. Well, folks, I hope you all enjoyed this little retrospective. Our look back at 5th edition is going to be a mainstay of the channel from now on, running parallel to our other main series, D&D Rules You Missed. As mentioned earlier, our next video is bringing the series up to speed with the unarmed tables of 1st edition. Meanwhile, we'll have a poll on our next video for a 5th edition retrospective. Both of these series are designed to maximize value for new and old players alike. Old players should be aware of the state of the industry and the hobby, keep up to date on content they might want for their games. New school players should know the bones of their hobby and understand why things work the way they do, and also steal rules for the games they're playing now. This hobby's 50 years old, there's a lot of good rules out there. Finally, we're releasing a zine on Kickstarter this week, as mentioned earlier. Uh, the Kickstarter is mostly to let us add art to the project. Designing exploration challenges is too fun for me to keep away from it, and the zine quest challenge of Kickstarter is an opportunity I just couldn't pass up. 
The zine is called Seven Willows, and it's meant to provide an exploration challenge based primarily on time and preparation. You could probably think of it as being some kind of deck builder, except you're using tabletop RPG resources to prepare in advance for the challenges you expect to face instead of cards. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. That, oh, you know what, the audio reminds me of one other thing. Uh, just before you go, folks, I know the audio might have sounded a little bit weird for this particular video. I'm pretty sure that doesn't have anything to do with my setup, even though, as of late, my microphone's been acting up a little bit on places like Discord. I chipped my two, not my two very front teeth, not the two front teeth on the, on the top row, on the, I chipped my two front teeth on the bottom row, and, uh, this has given me a little bit of an extra sibilance, along with a, uh, along with a little bit more tenor to my voice, I've noticed. So, if it sounds weird, that's the cause, uh, and probably not my microphone. If it is my microphone, it doesn't matter. Both of these issues will be fixed soon, so thank you for bearing with me. Alright folks, I'm out of here. Remember to click the Google form down in our description if you want to know when our Kickstarter goes live. You can also follow me at James Streisand on, or at J Streisand on Kickstarter. Without further ado, peace.